Well, if you've come to hear the lesson on the six days of creation, I'm sorry to disappoint, but we moved Friday night's lesson to last night, and now we're moving last night's lesson to this afternoon. We're going to talk about the unscientific nature of neo-Darwinian evolution. So far in the lessons we've presented, we've laid the groundwork for intelligent design and biblical faith versus macroevolution. And I have to tell you that just prepare you that t today will be lighter on scripture and heavier on the science side as we try to show that macroevolution is not built on operational science. Well, for the creationist, it's all pretty simple in that Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And as we said last night, not only was it God, but it was also the pre-incarnate Son, the Word, Jesus Christ, John 1, 1 through 3. And we see also a parallel passage in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by Him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's what we believe as creationists from God's word. Well, for the naturalistic evolutionist, it's quite a different picture. Everything began 13.8 billion years ago with a singularity smaller than the period that you see in the middle of this screen, in this singularity was compacted all space, time, energy, and mass of matter into this one point. And then at some point, it exploded in a big bang, and this random chaos and confusion of the explosion, we see created all the beauty and organization of our universe the grouping of the stars, the grouping of the galaxies, the solar systems, and the planets. And then we are told 4.54 billion years ago, the earth was formed. 3.8 billion years ago, the first single-celled life form evolved. And humans appeared only at the very end, at the very tip, 100,000 years ago. Which will we accept? Well, we said we were going to justify these lessons a little more tonight. I want to tell you about an objection to a Bible class that I heard in Texas on intelligent design. When I was in Texas on a business trip, there was an elder that was teaching an excellent class showing the impossibility of the evolution of DNA, which is essentially the evolution of information. A man in the back raised his hand and said, well, the fool said in his heart, there is no God, and that's good enough for me. About that time, a deacon raised his hand and said, that may be good enough for most of us as adults, but our young people are going off to the university, and their faith is being destroyed. As we pointed out last night, even the evolutionists say, evolution becomes the most potent weapon for destroying the Christian faith. <clears throat> we listed a number of young people who have lost their faith because of evolution that I've been confronted with. I'll list some more. When I was in Indiana, a homeschool family brought their child up to me and said, can you help our, our son? He's a teenager. He no longer believes in God because he read about evolution on the Internet. A man in South Carolina came to me and after a lecture with tears in his eyes, and he said, I've lost all three of my children to this teaching. A neighbor of ours in Pennsylvania didn't believe in God, and when we were able to sit down and have a study with him, he admitted he used to believe in God till in middle school he was taught about evolution. And then he became an atheist. Uh, I heard about two young Christians at a New Jersey university. The same thing happened to them. They studied evolution, and they became atheists. Well, I've given you some resources in the back to use, and if you just want one recommendation for something to buy for a high school student or a college student, I would recommend these two books, Refuting Evolution by Jonathan Sarfati, 
Also, the New Answers books, 1 through 5, are good. They have the most asked questions on the creation evolution uh, controversy. Just beware of Calvinism and premillennialism. Well, what's unscientific about the teaching of evolution, macroevolution? First of all, the doctrine of abiogenesis is unscientific. What is that? Abiogenesis is life arising from non-life. Is it even possible? Well, I want you to consider proteins because proteins are the fundamental building blocks of the cell. The first single cell organism in order to evolve would require 300 proteins for life. But there are even smaller building blocks that make up the proteins. To create the first bacterial protein, all 20 amino acids would first have to evolve. Amino acids are like the bricks that build the proteins that are like the house that build the living organism that is like the city. Well, even if all 20 amino acids could have hypothetically evolved, they would have immediately disappeared and been oxidized because theorists believe that the early atmosphere of the earth did contain oxygen. So that just does away with that right there. But let's grant them that these amino acids weren't oxidized. The first protein would have to be created by an enormous string of properly ordered amino acids. 267 properly ordered amino acids to make the first protein. Do you know what the chances of that are? That's like taking a 20-sided die and rolling it 267 times and hitting the number 7 every time. But it's worse than that. That's just one protein. The first bacterium has to have 300 proteins. So you have to take that 267 amino acids and multiply it by 300. Now you have to roll that 20-sided die 80,100 times and hit the number 7 every time to create the first protein. Again, that's not all. There's more. The chirality of amino acids must be left-handed and not right-handed. There are two conformations of amino acids. And we still don't know why, but life can only exist in the left-handed form. Now you have to take a coin and flip it 80,100 times and hit heads every time in order to form the first bacterial cell with 300 proteins. Now let's say that could occur, which is impossible. Before being functional, all these proteins would have to be folded into the precise 3D structure. You see, proteins are useless unless they're folded into a particular, very precise conformation. You might say, well, what's the big deal about misfolded proteins? I'll give you one word, Alzheimer's, or another word, BSE, mad cow disease. When proteins are misfolded, bad things happen. Well, before a protein can fold, it has to be coated with a tail that instructs the chain how to fold on itself. And in order for this to fold, it requires another protein called a chaperonin. This is a barrel-shaped structure in which the protein goes through the barrel and is folded properly. Do you know how that works? I'll tell you. I don't know. Nor does anybody know. No one even knows how this folding takes place, yet they're sure that the first bacterium evolved from 300 precisely folded proteins. Time fails us to describe all the other intricate biological mechanisms that are necessary to get the amino acids into the right sequence. Initiator tRNA, initiator factors, mRNA, rRNA, RNA polymerase, and then transcription and translation, of course. And finally, in addition to the minimum 300 precisely coded and folded proteins for the first bacterial cell to live, it has to be what? Self-replicating. It has to be able to reproduce itself, to regenerate itself, or the bacteria will disappear without a trace. This uh, requires hundreds of other cellular components. Cell membrane or wall, thylakoids, thylakoid membranes, phycobilosomes, keratinoids, phycoerythrins, and rubisco, etc., etc., etc. In conclusion of the first point, abiogenesis is out of the realm of possibility 
just in reference to the proteins. Well, point number two, macroevolution is not even scientifically testable or fals falsifiable. Falsifiability means you have to be able to determine whether something is true or false. If there's no way to determine whether it's false, then it's something that's simply assumed to be true, then it's a philosophy, then it is unscientific. Macroevolution is a rigged philosophy designed to prevent it from ever being disproven. Like a shell game. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Theodosius Dobzhansky of Harvard. Again, he's one of the architects of the modern synthesis of evolution. He says, it is impossible to reproduce in the laboratory the evolution of man. Experimental evolution deals of necessity with only the simplest levels of the evolutionary process, sometimes called what? Microevolution. But creationists agree with microevolution, right? That's what we talked about yesterday morning. Well, listen to Drs. Ehrlich and Birch in the journal Nature. Evolution cannot be refuted by any possible observations. Does that mean it's true? No. It is thus outside of empirical science, but not necessarily false. No one can think of ways in which to test it. I can actually, and some others have suggested ways in which it can be tested and it is proven false, but even the evolutionists admit that it can't be falsified or fa it's not falsifiable. Point three, neo-Darwinian evolution does not adhere to the four-tiered scientific method. Well, what does the scientific method involve? At least four elements. First, observation of some event in the universe. Second, development of a hypothesis to explain this event. Three, utilization of the hypothesis to design experiments. Four, conducting repeatable experiments in order to validate the hypothesis and come to a conclusion. So it would look like this. Observation, hypothesis, experiment. Only after experiment do you reach the a posteriori conclusion. Now Darwin stood the scientific method on his head. He said there's first an observation. There are many varieties of animals in the world, different kinds. So he had an hypothesis they came from a common ancestor. But without doing any experiments, he went straight to the a priori conclusion, the conclusion that precedes the experiments, and concluded, well, thus they must have had a common ancestor. And since then, since 1859, post hoc experiments have been going on, but never have they been able to prove macroevolution. Again, don't take my word for it. This is L. Harrison Matthews again from this morning writing the foreword to Darwin's On the Origin of Species. And again, we're excerpting some of these quotes. We're not taking them out of context. In accepting evolution as fact, how many biologists reflect that science is built upon experiments? Or remember that evolution has never thus been proved. Is it then a science or a faith? Well, the next point is that Evolutionists say, well, all you need is time, as long as you have these billions of years. And so that leads us to a question that I have received in a number of places, and so I have added this next section in. What about radiometric dating? It always comes back to radiometric dating. We're going to try to simplify this and look at it at a very high level. The first point about radiometric dating is that it's a technique that only measures the chemical composition of the rock, not the age. The ages are subjectively extrapolated, and they're based on nine unprovable assumptions. Well, how does radiometric dating work? Well, they're based on radioactive isotopes. These are elements that are radioactive, thus they're unstable, thus they lose particles from the nucleus. They spit out things such as alpha and beta particles. When this occurs, one element called the parent element turns into another element, the daughter element. That's right, one element turns into another element. One place someone laughed at me and said, one element can't turn into another element? Well, that's exactly what happens. And when it occurs at the current rate, 
of decomposition of the parent element, they arrive at a half-life in years. How long will it take for half of the element to be gone? Some of these elements are rubidium changing to strontium, uranium to lead, potassium to argon, samarium to neodymium, and carbon to nitrogen. And it would work like this. Based on today's decay rate of carbon-14 turning into nitrogen on what they can measure, half of it will be gone in 5,730 years. That's called the half-life. So then they measure how much carbon-14 is is in, uh, let's say, uh, a grave of a person. They measure how much carbon-14, how much nitrogen-14, and they can determine how long ago that person died. But that's assuming that these rates have always been constant. Now, there are nine unprovable assumptions that evolutionists have faith in. By faith, they believe they know how much parent element was in the rock when it was formed. This cannot be known. They believe they know how much daughter element was in the rock when it was formed. This cannot be known. They believe that they know no parent element leaked into the rock or that no parent element leaked out of the rock during millions of years. This cannot be known. By faith, they believe that no daughter element leaked out of the rock and no daughter element leaked into the rock during the millions of years. They also believe that the rate of radioactive decay has been constant over a period of four billion years. I have abbreviated these slides and so I don't have the other slides but if you were interested I could show you other evidence in which this decay rate has been shown not to be constant but varies based on a number of conditions in the earth. Number eight, by faith against evidence that proves otherwise, evolutionists believe that these radiometric clocks are reset when the daughter element is purged from the rock, when it is molten. This has been shown to be false. And finally, as we said before, evolutionists believe that eight common radiometric methods return the same age for the same rocks. But this is wrong. They return different ages. In fact, if you want to uh, achieve an older age, there are some methods that achieve an older age. Or a younger age, you can choose a method that achieves a younger age. I would recommend these two books that I have in the back, Thousands Not Billions and The Rate Project. That stands for Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth, in which creation scientists spent about a decade measuring the radioactive at radioactivity of different elements in rocks from around the world. Well, someone will say, and I've been confronted by individuals, how can you believe that the earth is young, just a few thousand years old? Is that just based on blind faith from scripture? Well, I believe there are some pretty strong scientific evidences. In fact, I believe that most methods that are used to date the earth actually return a young age instead of an old age. I've got an article in the back if you're interested in reading that that I wrote on it. Here are some evidences for a young earth. These are just a few. First of all, there's not enough sediment in the ocean. If sediment is dumping into the ocean at 20 billion tons a year, then the continents should have disappeared long ago if this has been going on for 4 billion years. There's not enough salt in the oceans. If the oceans are four billion years old, why isn't the ocean saturated with salt? There's only three and a half percent salt in the oceans. Next, there's not enough helium in the atmosphere. When uranium decays to lead, it produces helium, yet there's only five ten thousandths of a percent of helium in the atmosphere. The Earth's magnetic field is decaying too fast. It was twice as strong just 1,400 years ago. Our solar system has short-term comets. They should have disappeared five billion years ago. Why? Even the evolutionists admit that these comets only last 100 or 10 to 100,000 years. They call them dirty snowballs. They're balls of ice and every time they go around the sun they lose particles. Well if they only last for 10 to 100,000 years why do we still have them in our solar system if it is five billion years old? Next, there's not enough supernova remnants. You know, stars have been exploding at a pretty regular pace, one every approximately 25 years. 
And yet out of the 80 million stars that we know that we can see, there are only 270 supernova remnants. If they've been exploding one every 25 years, that limits the Earth just to a few thousand years old. Next, Mercury's molten core should have solidified billions of years ago. It should only take 300 million years to cool, and yet when the Mariner 10 spacecraft flew past it in 1974, they discovered that it still had a magnetic field indicating that it is still molten. Why hasn't it cooled in four and a half billion years? Next, diamonds and coal still have carbon-14 in them. Carbon-14 can only be detected up to a maximum, I'm not saying I believe this age, but a maximum of 95,000 years. If that's the case, why do these diamonds that are supposedly 1 to 3 billion years old still have carbon-14 in them? They're not 1 to 3 billion years old. Incidentally, almost all coal that has ever been measured still has carbon-14 in it. Next, the human population is too small. Based on a half percent annual growth rate, that's considering pestilence, disease, and war. Actually, the current growth rate is 1.1 percent. If you count the human growth rate half a, cent, half a percent per year since 2350 B.C., we, have, we should have around 7 billion people on Earth, which is what we have. Finally, there's not enough graves for humans to have lived on Earth for 100 to 200,000 years. If humans have lived here that long, there should be far more graves. You might be thinking, well, how can science be wrong? You're telling me tonight that science was wrong? I was taught that evolution was scientific. Well, here's the point. Operational science that follows the scientific method is an accurate tool, I believe, from God that he has given to man. But macroevolution does not follow the scientific method. As we said yesterday, it is a philosophy and not a science. Point number five, universally accepted scientific theories are overturned all the time. So the point is we shouldn't be surprised if a scientific theory is proven wrong. In the 16th to the 18th century, if you were schooled in Western Europe, you would have been taught the California Island Theory, that California is just an island off the western coast of America. In 1600, science said the sun revolved around the earth. Science was wrong. In 1750, science said that fire is caused by the release of phlogiston. Science was wrong. In 1800, science treated illnesses by bleeding people, which may have killed the first president of our country. Science was wrong. Um, 1860, Charles Darwin said women in African races were evolutionarily and intellectually inferior to white men. You might say, I didn't know Charles Darwin was misogynistic. Well, look at the subtitle of his second book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. You might say, well, I didn't know that he was racist. Well, look at this quote from his second book. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes, that is, these apes that look like and are parading as humans, will no doubt be exterminated. You might say, I was never taught that in school. Well, that's because the teacher only told you the first title of his book, On the Origin of Species, and didn't show you the subtitle, which is Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Well, did Darwin repent of this? No, by 1881, he wrote this in a letter. Looking to the world at no very distant date, what an endless number of the lower races will have been eliminated by the higher civilized races throughout the world. Darwinian evolution taught that Africans descended from the strong but unintelligent gorillas, the Orientals from the orangutans, and the whites from, surprise, surprise, the most intelligent of all, the chimpanzees. 
And I have to warn you, the next few slides are pretty heavy, but I think that even children need to understand what is being taught. This is, again, Ernst Haeckel, who we mentioned this morning. He had this quote in his book, The History of Creation. He said, I consider the Negro to be a lower species of man and cannot make up my mind to look upon him as a man and a brother, for the gorilla would then have to be admitted into the family. You see, Charles Darwin brought about and increased, increased the amount of racism in the Western world. But don't just take my word for it. Listen to Harvard paleontologist Stephen Gould. Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Now they had a scientific reason for their racism. Gould also said, in evolution, the price of perfect design is messy, relentless slaughter. And thus, slaughter they did. As a result of Darwin's teaching, Australian Aborigines, quote, specimens were in high demand to demonstrate that they were the missing link. Published documents prove that greater than 10,000 Aborigines remains were shipped to British museums. The Smithsonian Institute housed the remains of thousands of Aborigines. The New York Tribune, February 10, 1924, had this headline, Kindred of Stone Age Men Discovered on Antarctic Island. And guess what they called them? Missing links with mankind in the early dawn of history. These weren't even humans. They were missing links. I, re I put the quote, the uh, reference up here for, for these points just to let you know where you can find them. When there were only four remaining Aborigines on the island of Tasmania, Darwin requested their skulls provided that the request did not upset their feelings. Many museums wanted the skins of Aborigines or fresh specimens that could be stuffed. Dr. Edward Ramsey, curator of the Australian Museum in Sydney, published a book on how to plug holes in fresh specimens. He also requested the skulls of the bungee blacks. Four weeks later, a scientist sent him two corpses, proudly proclaiming the last of their tribe had just been shot. That's the sad history and the fruits of Darwinian evolution. Well, getting back to the point we were making, Scientific hypotheses are overturned all the time. We shouldn't be surprised. In 1940, they used lobotomies to treat the mentally ill. Science was wrong. In the 1960s, they taught if you went to school in the early 60s, you were probably taught the steady state theory of the universe, which was replaced in the 60s by the Big Bang Theory, which is in serious trouble now. And if you don't believe me, just go to Wikipedia. It has a section that devotes over 1,500 words to the problems with the Big Bang. And finally, 21st century eugenics in America to eradicate genetically inferior people. We hope that that will one day be denounced. What do we mean by that? 90% of all Down syndrome babies are aborted. And what about the scientific truth that the following drugs are safe? Finfin, fluoroquinolones, Vioxx, Darvacet, and Avandia. They cause less or more harm, but Avandia at least caused 83,000 heart attacks in eight years. Well, what is the point? Again, I'm going to say this one more time to emphasize operational science is an accurate tool from God, but macroevolution does not follow the scientific method and thus is a philosophy. Well, you might ask then, as a question was asked over lunch, then why has neo-Darwinism been accepted? Why do people accept it if it's so clear that it is unscientific? I think there's a number of reasons. First, maybe the parroting effect. We've been told we should believe in evolution, so people believe in evolution. For the sake of conformity, bowing down at the bully pulpit of Darwin, it's like sheep following other sheep off a cliff. Or as Jesus said in Matthew 15, 14, if the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch to conform to the crowd. 
Next, because of a bias against divine creation. Because people want to have a naturalistic explanation. They are committed to their doctrine, and I will call their religion of naturalism, that nature is all there is, there is no God, so they have to have an alternative theory for where we came from. Listen to Richard Lewontin of Harvard. Regarding this, he said, moreover, that materialism is absolute. That is, all that exists is the material. Nothing metaphysical, nothing spiritual. He said, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. God is expelled from the very beginning and not even given a chance. Point seven, intellectuals and scholars from the highest tiers of science and medicine reject neo-Darwinian evolution. We pointed out last night this movie, Expelled, with Ben Stein. Again, I suggest that you see it if you can. In this movie, he pointed out a number of uh, PhD scientists whose careers had been severely damaged because they questioned evolution and believed in intelligent design. One of these individuals was Richard Sternberg, who had two PhDs in molecular evolution and system science. Carolyn Crocker, an immunopharmacologist. Dr. Robert J. Marks, an electro electrical and computer engineer. And Dr. Guillermo Gonzalez, an astrophysicist. Now the response might be, well, lining up doctorates on your side doesn't prove that creation is true and evolution is false. Well, that's not the point. The point is that we are told that no credible scientists question evolution. So the point here is, yes, there are plenty. There are thousands around the world. We are also told that no one can understand medicine or biology unless they believe in evolution. Well, let's listen to Mark Kirshner, founding chair of the Department of Systems Biology from Harvard Medical School. He said, in fact, over the last 100 years, almost all of biology has proceeded independent of evolution, except evolutionary biology itself. Molecular biology, biochemistry, physiology have not taken evolution into account at all. Now I want to give you 13 impactful historic scientists who have rejected neo-Darwinian evolution since the beginning. Since 1859, there have been scientists rejecting Darwin's hypothesis. The first one is Joseph Henry, who discovered self-inductance. He was the first secretary of the Smithsonian Institute. He doubted and denied Darwinian evolution. Louis Pasteur, the father of pasteurization, who disproved spontaneous generation with his swan neck flasks. He denied Darwinian evolution. James Jewell, the father of thermodynamics, didn't believe in Darwinism. And then one of my heroes, Dr. Joseph Lister, the father of antiseptic surgery in a time when doctors would not wash their hands and he tried to convince them to sterilize their hands and their utensils by the use of phenols. Have you ever heard of the bacteria Listeria or Listerine, well, this is who it's named after, Joseph Lister. He was a creationist. And then one of the most impactful individuals in all of scientific history, Gregor Mendel, the father of genetics. Whereas Darwin performed no experiments, Gregor Mendel performed experiments that with data that most scientists would salivate over. He used over 28,000 pea plants to produce his data. And from Gregor Mendel, we have the modern understanding was born of genetics. Um, James Irwin, astronaut and lunar module pilot on the Apollo 15. George Washington Carver, the father of African-American scientists. I don't have to introduce the next individual. I'm sure most of you know who he is in this area. Werner von Braun, the man that put us on the moon. And then Dr. Raymond Damadian, 
Dr. Damadian invented the MRI. He is a very staunch six-day creationist. He received the National Medal of Technology from Ronald Reagan in 1988, and there are over 60 million MRIs performed a year that have saved countless thousands of lives. Dr. Damadian says this, I've been looking at the data for years and I think evolutionists are just spinning their wheels. The argument that evolution occurred by chance has no foundation in reality. Now I'm going to try to play a 50 second clip so you can actually see Dr. Damadian. Hi, my name is Dr. Raymond Damadian. I'm a young earth creation scientist and believe that God created the world in six 24-hour days as recorded in the book of Genesis. Furthermore, I believe that evolution is a lie designed to weaken people's faith in the accuracy of the Bible. By God's grace and the devoted prayers of my godly mother-in-law, I invented the MRI scanner in 1969. The idea that scientists who believe the earth is 6,000 years old cannot do real science is simply wrong. For years, I have been passionate about helping young people understand that the theory of evolution as the origin of man, as taught in our educational system, has no scientific evidence to support it, and that it is not science, but it is science fiction. Question evolution, cite Dr. Damadian. Also, Dr. James Tour one of the 10 most cited chemists in the world. He's an organic synthetic chemist who basically makes molecules from scratch. You can see a number of his lectures on YouTube. Then I want to introduce you to Dr. Michael Denton. I have this book in the back and we've talked about the modern intelligent design movement this weekend. Well, this is the father of the modern intelligent design movement in the sense that in 1985, he wrote this book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. And when he wrote this book, a number of young scientists picked it up, which spawned the intelligent design movement. Men such as Michael Behe and William Dembski and Jonathan Wells and Stephen Meyer. But at the time, Michael Denton was an agnostic. But notice what he says in the book. The influence of evolutionary theory on fields far removed from biology is one of the most spectacular examples in history of how a highly speculative idea for which there is no really hard ev scientific evidence can come to fashion the thinking of a whole society and dominate the outlook of an age. I think his testimony is especially weighty since he didn't even believe in God in the first place, he was just saying macroevolution is wrong. Well, one of the individuals he influenced was Dr. Michael Behe, who we introduced last night. And notice what Behe says. From Mivart to Margulis, there have always been respected scientists who have found Darwinism inadequate. Well, who is this he's talking about? Mivart and Margulis. Well, Mivart was George Jackson Mivart, who lived in Darwin's day. Darwin had a bachelor's in theology. Here was a man that had his MD and PhD in biology, and he was one of Darwin's earliest critics who showed the inability of Darwinism to account for the parallel evolution of identical anatomical structures. That is the wing and the pterosaur and the bat and the bird. They look very similar, don't they? But apparently, they claimed that they didn't evolve from one another. They just so happened to evolve the same structure, convergent evolution. Well, who is Margulis? Margulis is Lynn Margulis. If this helps you, she is the ex-wife of the late Carl Sagan. She's one of the most promi prominent evolutionists in the world. Although she denies that everything that we she denies everything that is being taught in school regarding neo-Darwinism. She says neo-Darwinism is wrong. She says neo-Darwinism will one day be viewed as a minor 20th century religious sect. Neo-Darwinism, which insists on the slow accrual of mutations by gene level natural selection, is a complete funk. Now her idea to replace neo-Darwinism I think is even more far-fetched, but nevertheless she does discount 
macroevolution in terms of neo-Darwinism. And if that's not enough scientists, here are a thousand and four more. In 2001, a petition was started called A Scientific Descent from Darwinism. And to, in order to be able to sign this, you have to have a PhD in a relevant field or have an MD and be a professor. And there are over a thousand signers. And these signers come from very, uh, are very high tiered, including members of the National Academy of Sciences, members of the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences, uh, Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Hindustan Academy of Sciences, as well as from some of the major universities in the world, Stanford, Duke, Rice, Emory, Carnegie Mellon, Johns Hopkins, Vanderbilt, Bristol, Cambridge, Manchester, and it, the list goes on and on and on. Well, in order to sign this, if you were an MD, you had to be a professor. For those that weren't a professor, in 2004, they started a second petition. Physicians and surgeons who dissent from Darwinism. And at the last count, this petition had 868 signers, and it listed some of the top international physicians and surgeons in the world. I'm going to set up this last quote. Actually, we have two more quotes before the end of the lesson. But to set up this quote, I will say that in the 1970s, there was a flurry of debates between creationists and evolutionists. Some of you can probably even remember those. And most of the times, the creationists came out on top. And the evolutionists were severely um, beaten. So thus, by 1980, Dr. Earl Hansen made this statement. Why do creationists seem to be the consistent winners in public debates with evolutionists? We biologists are our own worst enemies in the creationist-evolutionist controversies. We must no longer duck this. Go out and get them, boys and girls, is what he said. Well, in the next 16 years, there were even more debates between 1980 and 1996 such that by 1996, Eugenie Scott, one of the top evolutionists in the country, really she's an anti-creationist, is, is her main job is to oppose creationism in the United States. She made this statement by 1996, avoid debates. If your local campus Christian fellowship asks you to defend evolution, please decline. Public debates rarely change many minds. What does she mean? She means that it rarely changes many creationist minds. And then she says it's basically just a game and you will probably get beaten. Well, thank you for your attention. I think, I hope I've made clear that neo-Darwinian evolution is unscientific and that we should put our faith in God's word. Romans 3 and verse 4 says, Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, When you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And Proverbs 30 verses 5 and 6, Every word of God is pure. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Let's put our faith in the God of the Bible and his six days of creation. Exodus 31, 17. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh he rested. Let's turn our thoughts now to our Lord Jesus as we offer an invitation tonight. You know, many times, and some of my friends that I talk to, they say they want to be saved like the thief on the cross. And there are many ways you can respond to that and answer that from Scripture. But here's something to point out to them. Why can we not be saved like the thief on the cross today? Well, turn over to Romans the 6th chapter and verse 3. Notice Romans 6 and verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. 
We are unable, or the, the thief on the cross could not have been saved like we are saved. Why? Because when we are saved, our baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When the thief was on the cross, Jesus hadn't died, hadn't been buried, and hadn't been resurrected. And thus we continue on in verse 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Would you like to be freed from sin tonight? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and are ready to make him Lord of your life? If so, and you'd like to be baptized, why don't you come forward and make your wishes known as we sing this invitation hymn. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.